Have you ever wondered what was the worst operating system in all of history? That's what we're gonna go over today. I'm Theo Joe, and I made this list of the top seven worst operating systems in history. So we're gonna go over in order, at least in my opinion, what they were. Some of these you may have heard of, some of them almost definitely not, but still, if you have one that you hate even more, you can always let us know down in the comments. So starting off with number seven, we have Windows ME, officially pronounced Windows ME. This came out in the year 2000, and this has such a bad reputation. It's actually nicknamed, sometimes people say, as Windows Mistake Edition, although so it's funny because this was such an unpopular operating system that most people saying how bad it was never actually used it themselves. Technically the ME stands for Millennium Edition and basically this was supposed to be for personal users as opposed to Windows 2000 which was around the same time and more for business and enterprise. And most say that the problem with Windows ME was that it was a rushed attempt at the last minute and never really needed to exist in the first place. It was just kind of there to fill a gap for people who were personal users of Windows 2000. And it didn't really they need to exist because it came between Windows 98 and Windows 98 SE, which was superior before it, and then it was followed by the far superior Windows XP, which again, obviously became extremely popular. So there was kind of that weird middle ground. And Windows ME had a reputation of crashing, being slow, and having a lot of performance issues, bugs, and just a reputation of being terrible in general. So in that super short life cycle, there wasn't really any time to improve it or fix it by the time XP came out, and it had such a small market share that most people hearing the reputation just stuck with Windows 98, didn't even bother using it. I was able to actually boot Windows ME into a virtual machine, and I think it just looks like any other version that's old of Windows. So it looks almost exactly the same like Windows 2000 that I remember using in school, but Microsoft did actually add a lot of features to it. For example, Internet Explorer 5.5, it had Windows Movie Maker, which made it so anyone could edit videos, and it also had a bunch of hideous Windows Media Player themes and skins. I mean, honestly, what are these? these are just truly bizarre. So yeah, Windows ME definitely goes down to history as one of the worst versions of Windows. Moving on to number six, we have MS-DOS version 4.0. Now the series of MS-DOS operating systems were not actually that bad. They were considered pretty good, especially version 3.3. But when 4.0 came along, there were some problems. The biggest problem was that DOS 4.0 was found to crash constantly and freeze by those who used it, or at least some of them. So again, it had a horrible reputation and also was really buggy with compatibility problems. Even though it did have such a horrible reputation though, it did add some significant features. For example, it had a GUI and it actually had support for mouses if you actually had the driver for them. And surprisingly, after a bit of digging, I was again able to install MS-DOS 4.0 onto a virtual machine and there's not much to see though. Apparently back then there was nothing pre-installed. So it's basically just the command prompt, the file system, the ability to change theme colors and some DOS utilities. So looking in DOS utilities, it basically just lets you set the date and time and copy disks. That's pretty much it. Backup and restore and format. And then the change colors had some ugly, ugly colors. That's all I can say. You had the file system, which was basically just a file explorer program, which kind of shows directories and files within it. And there's not much in the file system. You can see that there are some old programs you might recognize though, such as check disk. And then the command prompt is pretty much what you'd expect. It looks really similar to what we have today. So just even fewer commands. I mean, this version of DOS literally didn't even have the help command, which is, was introduced in 5.0. So yeah, basically DOS 4.0 was just found to be very buggy, unstable, and most people just stuck with 3.3. All right, on to number five, we have one that you probably have never heard of before. It's called the Incompatible Time Sharing System, ITS, and this is from the 1960s. Basically, it was created by hackers in the 60s at MIT for use on the PDP-6 and PDP-10 series computers. So these are big old style computers that are basically mainframes, not the type of personal computers you're used to. And this operating system was written pretty much from scratch in assembly code. So pretty close to machine code, if you ask me. And I don't know why the name says incompatible. Maybe it's because it was specifically written for just those computers and wouldn't really work on anything else. But the time sharing part of it means that it was for computers that are meant to be shared remotely possibly, not just a personal computer. So a lot of times you, these old computers are mainframes and then people would 
would be allowed to have access for a certain amount of time on those computers and use it. Now, this operating system being so early in the computer era was not necessarily bad for its time. However, if looking back at it, it was missing a lot of stuff that we take for granted today and can't imagine not having. For example, there was a flat directory structure, which basically meant that there were no subdirectories whatsoever. Every user got one directory. That was it. You had to put everything in there, no organization whatsoever. Also, apparently, it only allowed files to have exactly a six character file name and and it was monocase, which means that you couldn't have different uppercase and lowercase letters. It didn't matter. Another interesting thing is that security was basically non-existent. There were no passwords initially. So anyone could log into anyone else's session, but it was apparently polite to apparently log in so that people could see you wanting to get on. I don't exactly know how it worked, but there were no passwords. And also that meant that anybody could edit anyone else's files in their other directories, even the system files and source code. So if someone was malicious, they could literally just go in and just delete everything off. But I believe because it was at MIT and probably everyone using it was faculty or staff and other people could see the logs to see who did what, it was probably just in everyone's best interest to behave in there. So yeah, not exactly an operating system that I think would work out too well these days. All right, now on to number four, we have Java OS. This was a operating system built entirely or mostly on Java by Sun Microsystems or the subsidiary JavaSoft. This operating system was announced in 1996, but it only lasted three years before being discontinued in 1999 because apparently basically nobody used it. And because there were basically no computers that actually did run on it, I did have some trouble finding some screen shots, but you can see some examples of programs that were using this. Now, in the initial press release announcing this operating system, it described it as a highly compact operating system designed to run Java applications directly on microprocessors in anything from net computers to pagers. So basically, it was designed to be very compact and be able to run on embedded devices. So these aren't necessarily personal computers, but also be able to do on ATMs or, like it said, pagers, very small, discrete, purpose-built devices. It was actually licensed by several major companies, but apparently they never actually used it, even though they licensed it. Also, from what I've read, because the operating system was written in Java as opposed to C, which was like most other operating systems, people said that this operating system would have tended to run a lot slower than the other operating systems, so that probably didn't help anything. Based on what I could find, really the only computer that ever did actually run on it was the Java Station computer, which was created by Sun Microsystems themselves. Themselves. And this thing was even so unpopular that I could really only find a few grainy screenshots from ancient documentation files. But I would recommend if you're interested in this Java station, there's another YouTuber by the name of Cameron Gray, who did a whole video about the Java station. He was able to get it to boot up. So rather than, you know, steal his screenshots and stuff, I will direct you to go check out his video. It's very cool. He's able to boot it up and you can see the whole interface and stuff on his video. So basically Java OS was a complete failure that only lasted three years and it only ran on pretty much one computer that was officially built by Sun Microsystems and no one even really used that. All right, on to number three. You guys knew this one was gonna be on the list. It's Windows Vista from 2006. Now, I should point out that eventually, after some service packs, Vista did turn out okay, but on launch and for a while, it was pretty much a disaster. A lot of people just had a lot of problems. For example, because of the new fancy graphics with Aero and a lot of the stuff being upgraded and improved in the back end, it was very hardware intensive. So a lot of people who were maybe upgrading from their current computer to Vista from XP, they would notice that Vista would run a lot slower on the equipment hardware. So they thought that, well, Windows Vista just sucks, but really it was probably just their computer. But at the same time, it wasn't exactly their fault because you kind of expect a certain level of performance if you're upgrading. Also, because a lot was redone on the back end, there was compatibility issues, which relied on equipment manufacturers to update the drivers that you could download. And sometimes they were slow to do this or didn't do it at all. So maybe your keyboard or mouse, if it didn't get an update, you wouldn't be able to use it as well. And apparently even more central device manufacturers for core components like in video for graphics cards, even though they did update the drivers, they caused crashes and stuff. So there was just a lot of problems with the drivers overall. Another thing people didn't like is the user account control. This was a really great feature in terms of security, but it was so new and people just found it very annoying and intrusive because every time you try to do something, it would pop up a prompt to do it and it would just be annoying. And perhaps it was too intrusive because even now these days on Windows 10, I think it's a lot better. I even have my UAC set to maximum on Windows 10 and I believe that pops up 
way less frequently than it did on Windows Vista back in the day. And there were some features that I actually really liked. For example, the gadgets pane, I was kind of sad when that was removed in later versions. And after about a year, Service Pack 1 was released, which fixed a lot of things. And then a year later, Service Pack 2. But by that time, Windows 7 was just around the corner. People were using the beta of that, seeing how great it was. And because Windows XP was already so popular before, a lot of people saw the reputation of Windows Vista and just said, you know what, I'm never gonna even bother using that. I'm gonna stay on XP and then maybe upgrade to Windows 7. So Windows Vista never really got an even chance to recover. All right, on to number two, you probably knew this one was coming as well. It's Windows 8 from 2012. Basically at the time, Microsoft was trying to really blend desktop and mobile tablet interfaces. I guess they saw that mobile devices were becoming more popular and they said, you know what, we should have the same exact interface on a desktop with a keyboard and mouse as a touchscreen tablet, which did not exactly go over too well. And in my opinion, this is because they really shifted too far towards the being touch friendly part of it. For example, they did a lot of things that were horrible on a desktop. They removed the start button, for example. They had the start menu become just a full screen start screen. And while yes, this may have played out well if you were using a touchpad device, on a desktop, it really just didn't translate. Windows 8 also had the new Metro style apps, which are now known as universal Windows platform apps. And these were a bit confusing as well because they would open in full screen, but they had no way to minimize or close out. There was no close out or minimize button on these, so people were really confused by them. There was also the charms bar, which had to be accessed by swiping from the right or moving the cursor over, but it was not really intuitive. There were no real instructions on how to use anything. So if someone came up to the computer and didn't know how to access those things, they would just not be able to access them. Another really weird thing was that you could get to the desktop interface, but only by clicking on the desktop tile on the start screen. And there was no way to boot to the desktop by default. And once you were there, there was no start button. So it was not exactly clear how to get back to the start screen. You had to basically press the Windows key on your keyboard, which is not intuitive at all. I almost never use that key anyway. Now, eventually Microsoft did release Windows 8.1 in 2013, which improved a lot of the Windows interface for keyboards and mouse. For example, it brought back the start button, which would open the start screen. So there was still no start menu, but at least the button was there. It also allowed you to boot to the desktop by default and also they later added the close and minimize buttons to Windows Store apps. So obviously a lot of people found this super confusing coming from previous versions of Windows, though it wasn't all necessarily bad. There were actually some good additions. For example, the fast startup feature which allowed much faster boot times. There were task manager improvements. There was an upgraded Windows Explorer. It also included Windows Defender built in which was a reasonable antivirus. There was also support for DPI scaling if you have different monitors of different sizes, and there was also cloud syncing settings. So a lot of features, but because it was so unintuitive and just had such a bad reputation, a lot of people didn't even bother upgrading. I know I didn't. I just stuck to Windows 7. I was like, I am not even going to touch that. I did try, I think, one computer that was using it. It was so bad that I didn't even want to use it at all. All right, so finally, on to number one. In my opinion, the worst operating system in history, we have Lindos from 2001. No, I'm not misspeaking. No, that's not a spelling error. There was actually an operating system called Lindos. And no, it wasn't a joke either. It was a legitimate serious attempt to basically create a operating system based in Linux that had a Windows-like interface and also supported running major Windows applications through use of Linux's Wine API. The problem was it didn't work. And apparently after just a few months of trying to develop it, the creators eventually scrapped the initial idea and focused on just making an operating system that would make it very easy to install Linux applications on it. But there were actually some interesting features they did add to it. For example, a so-called click and run software distribution service, which was GUI based, which made it very easy to install any number of Linux software packages. Keep in mind, this was back in 2001 when that was sort of a novelty. The service apparently had over 30,000 apps that could be installed through this. However, it wasn't free. There was a basic service, which was about 20 bucks a year, which allowed you to use it. And and at the time, it actually received a lot of criticism from the Linux community for having paid proprietary software in there that you had to pay for to use, which was kind of against the whole idea of the Linux community, I guess. Also, Microsoft wasn't exactly happy about this whole thing either because of the name, I guess. So they actually sued the creators of Lindos and actually lost. The court sided with the Lindos creators. However, Microsoft eventually settled by supposedly paying $20 million to them to buy the rights to the name Lindos. So then the operating system was re 
renamed to Linspire, which is what it's still called today. So it wasn't like this was just some random hobby project. It actually did get a sort of amount of recognition and actually companies bought it and has changed hands in terms of ownership over the years. So it is a legitimate operating system. It just never really became popular because of all the criticism. And well, it's just kind of a weird concept. And there's plenty of other way more popular distributions of Linux, such as Ubuntu. So it really just never took off, which is probably why you've never heard of it. So let me know down in the comments if you have an operating system that you think should have been number one, or you think that should have been on the list in the first place, let me know down there. If you guys want to keep watching, the next video I'd recommend is one I made recently talking about Windows features that you probably didn't know that you could disable. So I'll put that link right there. You can just click on it. So thanks so much for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.